so much, and thanks so much to the organizers for creating such a wonderful event. So I wanted to start some housekeeping. Um, you guys can read everything else. So basically, because of my treatment, um, sometimes I have difficulty breathing, so I may pause to take a breath, and my mouth gets really dry, so I may pause to take a drink. Um, and my memory's really bad, so I also may pause because I have no idea what the fuck's going on. So you guys can figure out which one I'm stopping for. Um, also, uh, my tumor's in my chest, so I have my very own face hugger. And that's a picture of the slide of it that I had to fight really hard to get. Because this might be the only thing my body may grow, so look at my baby. <laughs> okay, so what text am I using? I'm going to use Prometheus. Um, alien Covenant and Aspects of Alien Isolation. Now, you might say, why Alien Isolation? That's a video game, it's not a movie. Well, um, 20th Century Fox added scenes to that IGN YouTube video series that they did um, in order to expand upon Amanda Ripley's um, connection with her mother, so that's why I justified including it. Um, also, because we talked about mothers a lot today, I'm gonna try and zoom through those sections so we can get to fathers and maybe things people haven't heard about. So this is my thesis statement, so you can't say you don't know what I'm arguing, because my memory's really bad. So um, basically I'm saying that even though these texts take place in the future, um, surrounding issues of patriarchy and motherhood <laughs> remain, so the future still kind of sucks. Um, additionally, every text has a unifying theme of the perversion of creation done by um, men, or people who are male-presenting, mad scientists, bad dads. So involuntary childness and infertility. So I'm just going to zoom past this. So essentially, lots of women feel shame, um, shame and stigma when it comes to infertility. And I thought this scene with Dr. Shaw and her partner Holloway is really interesting because Holloway does this throwaway comment about how everyone, anyone can create life. All you need is half a brain and some DNA. And he's very flippant about it. But the viewer finds out that when he says that, he himself is growing something very nefarious inside him. It's that virus. So he's very flippant about creating life, but he's doing it himself with the process that ultimately kill him. Um, but I also think that was kind of insensitive that he said that to Dr. Shaw, because it seems like it's a well-established thing in their relationship that she's struggling with fertility. And she says, I can't create, I can't, I can't create life. What does that say about me? implying that if a woman's infertile, it's unnatural, it's against nature, she's full of wrong things. Um, and what struck me as someone, and because I'm in women's studies, I can include I, because we believe the personal is political. As someone who's also struggling with fertility problems, I was very disappointed in Dr. Holloway, because I too am dating an academic and an academic myself, and I've had a very similar conversation with my own partner, who's male, um, even though we like to think we're woke all the time, feminist things, sometimes things still really hit you and it stinks. Um, and he didn't let me take that burden on myself. He took my hand and said, it's not I, it's we. We, we're a team. Um, and I'm sorry that Dr. Shaw did not have the same experience. So it, he took the onus off me and put it on us. Um, so, and this other thing I'm just going to quickly zoom through. So in Prometheus, we can go to space. We can create med pods to treat people without the help of doctors. We can create creepy as all hell evil androids, but we're not able to solve an issue that impacts women um, socially. And what, surprisingly, this shocks me mostly because Wayla Yutani is portrayed throughout the entire series as being very profit-driven and kind of evil and, w and willing to do anything or sacrifice anything for profit, but they don't do this. Um, so I was thinking about why they, they wouldn't focus on infertility. Um, I was thinking, well, you know, there's gender issues in medicine now, issues that um, are important to men are focused on, women are pushed to the side. But in this future, to me, it doesn't make sense because they're focused on colonization. Even if the Earth is overpopulated, they're obviously not getting a lot of people to lead the Earth and into the colonies. So if they focused on infertility treatments, um, they would have a steady stream of really great colonists and uh, therefore an opportunity to create a lot of profit by sending those colonists off to mine. Um, so the only thing I can think of is that maybe Wayland Yutani just doesn't know how to market to women. And again, in infertility treatments for women, um, women are more likely to seek them out if they're suffering from infertility, and they're much more expensive than male treatments. So why is Wayland Yutani not making bank, or Wayland, the Wayland Corporation in this? Like, that doesn't make sense to me as a, as a viewer as well. So mad scientist, bad dads. Here we're getting to the meat of the stuff. So um, mad scientists and bad dads, um, are very similar to what's happening with Frankenstein's in the alien universe. Um, 
So the majority uh, of fathers pictured in Prometheus in isolation and in covenants are mad scientists, a term loaded with gendered implications. Um, so these are all the um, things that theorists think are, compile a gendered mad scientist, bad dad. Um, they have a sense of masculinity that's expressed through power and control. They're overreaching, their secrecy, experimentalism, and magic. And I think we should um, add a sixth tenant if the mad scientist is a father. Um, he has to abandon his creation to suffer in the world alone as he pursues his own selfish needs. Now this goes back into thinking that science is gendered as male, nature is gendered as female, and the implications of this are that women are expected to feel, whereas men are expected to think. And that's still present in the science, uh, sciences today. There was that horrible physics guy that said women can't do physics. Women constantly have to prove themselves, such as um, with that black hole photo. There were all those men saying that she really didn't do it herself. So there's still issues there. I'm going to. So we're just going to go through all the bad dads um, in the series. Um, so the engineers, I'm going to read this so I don't forget anything. Um, in Prometheus, the engineers are shown wanting to destroy one of their most problematic creations, um, humanity. Uh, the engineers are in turn destroyed by a bi biological weapon um, created to cull what the engineers deem to be disappointing creations, such as humans and missteps. The engineers being destroyed naturally by a biological weapon they created might also be seen as a reflection of the fury of the natural world rebelling against disorder. This is an idea that is, also has a long history in horror texts, with Frankenstein being the most prominent example. Another connection with Frankenstein occurs when the militant variant engineer is aroused from its hypersleep to be confronted by some of his children with questions about their existence and how to extend that existence. The father engineer reacts with ang anger and loathing and either successfully kills or attempts to kill his children. So the engineers take no responsibility for the behavior of their offsprings. After creating humanity by forcibly sacrificing a male presenting member of their own, the engineers do not actively nourish, support, or in any way parent their creations. Literally, they create us and then bounce, and then come back and be like, what happened here? This is a disaster. I guess we better kill them. Um, which basically, I think, doesn't show that they uh, parent very well. Um, Scott in interviews says he, the engineers are disappointed in us because we're killing the planet and we're killing themselves and behaving um, like a bunch of children. And the only thing that's stopping them is because it's a very time consuming and long process to totally destroy a planet. So I think they're obviously not very good fathers. And it goes with mad scientists' fathers abandoning children for their own selfish needs, as well as creating this disaster um, for progeny. Even though it's not our fault, because who raised us? No one. Damn, Dad. OK, so Peter Wade. Um, he's a billionaire, he's an inventor, he's a colonizer. <laughs> And a lot of um, Prometheus and Covenant focuses on his relationship with David and his role as a creator to David. So he's a horrible father not only to David, but to all paternal relations. Um, David is constantly belittled and berated by Wayland from the moment he begins to exist. The initial interaction between David and Wayland is shown in the touching opening scene of Alien Covenant. Wayland introduces himself to David as his father and simultaneously tells David to refer to him as father, creator, and master, showing the masculinity and power that is aligned with the stereotypical mass scientist. He is initially reluctant to call David his son. At first, Wayland refers to David as his creation. Another crew member, Meredith Vickers, reminds Wayland that a king has his reign and then he dies. It's inevitable. That is the natural order of things, before referring to Wayland as father. Wayland, however, does not want to adhere to the advice of a woman, nor does he acknowledge Vickers as his daughter. He rejects the natural order in nature and accordingly meets his fate. Prior to his death, Wayland manages to have a brief conversation with his own father uh, and creator, the militant variant engineer, even though Wayland relies on David to translate for him. Um, an extended version of this scene reveals additional insights into Wayland's motivations. After being asked by why, why he came, Wayland speaks to the engineer and points to David, stating, Do you see this man? I made him in my own image so that I would be perfect. You and I, we are superior. We are creators. We are gods. And gods never die. This is clearly a moment of mad scientist overreach that goes horribly wrong and ends disastrously. The engineer does not take kindly to that statement or Wayland wanting to be a god and basically rips off David's head and bludges, bludges Peter Whalen um, to death with it. Um, so it's a warning to those that profane and assume themselves to be above nature. Um, however, there's a sympathetic moment, uh, an aspect to Wayland's death, and that ties into the main concept that I have in my book 
um, which is that fathers often get sympathetic moments in horror texts, whereas mothers typically do not. Um, so Wayland's death doesn't not only reveal a rich old man with nefarious intent trying to get money and live forever, um, but also reveals a scared and sad old man fading into oblivion, knowing the only thing that greeted him was darkness, and the only farewell was from someone who wasn't even human. David even recognizes the event um, as a time for pity and sympathy, albeit in this case emotions that, can't, that come from a place of narcissism and not sincerity. When asked about Wayland, David says, he was human, entirely unworthy of his creation. I pitied him at the end. So David. David clearly resents being bound into some servant by beings that he doesn't think are as superior as him. And um, the response to Elizabeth asking about um, what happens after, you know, if Wayland dies, David basically says he'd be free and doesn't everybody want their parents dead? And Elizabeth immediately responds, well, I didn't. Um, yeah, so the difference between human and android there as well. Um, so David desires every, all of his parents to be dead and to be the sole godlike creator of a new biological life. Um, and this desire causes David to massacre the engineers in entirety, destroying their entire simulation with bioweapons. Murderous thoughts and actions aside, David is an archetypical mad scientist and bad father. Experimentation is the focus of David's life. He cares little for anything else. For instance, David deliberately puts the bioweapon chemical on Holloway's drink to see what would happen. David Lindenolf, the screenwriter of Prometheus, claims that David doesn't know he's poisoning Holloway. He asks Holloway, what would you be willing to do to get your answers, to get answers to your questions? Holloway says anything and everything. And that basically overrides whether, whatever ethical programming David is mandated by, allowing him to spike the drink. Flimsy ethic protocols are startlingly on brand, and that brand is mad scientists. And this does not negate the fact that David deliberately chooses not to frame his question in a way that would indicate um, human experimentation. So I've said before that David has his abortions on display in a couple of comments for sections and his bestiary. So um, let's see. Um, so ooh, rewind. Um, he takes um, a, a character through there. So later in the scene, after the reveal of the abortions, and just prior to a face hugger attaching itself to an unwilling victim in front of David, um, Scott, um, the director's commentary, and Alien Covenant says, we're going to see a birth here. Because David creates them in a funny way, he is the father. Notably, throughout the prequels, the audience has not been shown a true xenomorph. None of the, the creatures David, the engineer, or Elizabeth Bird create have featured the biomechanical elements that the original xenomorph creation is known for. In the final scene of Alien Covenant, which features a voluntary and non-fatal but no less horrifying birth of unnatural children by the male David, provides an obvious clue as to where this series is going. Although because of the commercial failure of Alien Covenant, there is doubt as to whether or not Scott will be able to make the final two films he intended. Um, and this end game, I think, um, this hypothetical end game I've come up with, arguably ties into overarching feelings on synthetics throughout the alien universe. So first known synthetics are all created by men, um, all of them. Um, Wayland and um, David and Walter, um, Bishop, uh, Michael Bishop and um, his hyperdyne system numbered models and um, he actually creates them in the, the as himself, which is the most vain thing I could ever think of. Um, and Joe Sieg's sons, and the name Sieg's son is formerly Sieg's and sons, notably not Sieg's and children, Sieg's and daughters, creates those really scary and horrible um, working <coughs> Joes. Um, and um, second generation creation synthetics are created by synthetics themselves. So that's again like perversion, like a male birth, and then like a machine made birth. Um, and um, synthetics face discrimination or, and are despised. Ripley hates them after it happened. And Holloway um, in Prometheus is a flat out um, bigot and bias against synthetics. And no one else in the crew corrects them or stops his behavior. So it's shown that maybe this behavior has some degree of acceptance that someone is not going to say, can you please stop being a dick to the android that controls the entire thing? Maybe we won't want to piss him off. Um, so this goes to what Walter tells his synthetic um, counterpart, David. Um, the Wayland Corporation has stopped making synthetics so lifelike because their creativity and emotion was unsettling to human owners. So that's the um, uncanny valley concept. Um, 
Like all creatures created by men, synthetics can fall into the uncanny uncan valley and be despised for it, representing an artificial construction of life from an unnatural source. David thinks this is superior to life, birds, or created by nature, and the females of various species. David states, I found perfection here. I created it, a perfect organism. This line also ties into Ash, the, syn the synthetic from Alien, who uses the phrase a perfect organism to describe the, the xenomorph. Um, notably, in the commentary for Alien Covenant, Scott says that during the film's final scenes, after he is successful in non-fatal birthing of the xenomorph embryos, David feels like a god here. Gods are artificial. Therefore, I hypothesize, and if anyone puts this on the internet and does not cite me, I will, if I end, I die of cancer, I'll haunt you as a ghost forever, so. Um, so, I hypothesize that the final incarnation of the xenomorph, um, as seen in Alien, is ultimately intended to be birds from David, and absorbing him the protomorphal transform, gaining the biomedical elements and dark metallic shine of the xenomorph. So you see what was in Covenant, and it's missing those tubes that you see a lot of the time, thanks to a wonderful effect from Alien, when much he's spitting milk that was used to lubricate things, um, that are found in those bio things. So that's what I think the endgame is. Um, so basically, I'm going to zoom to the rest of this. Um, they say, so the writer of um, Prometheus says that, um, Prometheus is just a, a, a um, fertility kind of experiment thing. Um, and that it's a reflection of um, putting all these three creators, having them have sex and seeing what comes out. And um, Lindendorf describes um, the egg in Alien as being an egg and the facehugger being the sperm. But basically it's a rape metaphor, um, I think. And um, while um, Prometheus does have male birth, which, what, which is what made Alien so subversive, going after men, as O'Bannon said, he wanted to make men cross their legs and not women. Um, I basically think of Prometheus, it's a failure. Dr. Shaw's birth scene totally negates this. It's bloody. She's the most naked out of everyone. She's in serious pain. And interestingly, the, this scene also, it's the most blood you ever see, really, too, like splattering around. And um, this scene also features another trope in horror, which is a um, male um, gatekeeper and father knows best. You see this in Dracula with Lucy and Van Helsing. Um, where Van Helsing's like, listen to me, shut up and listen to me, but he doesn't tell her any like facts, and then um, bounces and she dies because she doesn't, he never explains the importance and doesn't bother telling her things. And that's like David, he refuses to let her see the baby, he refuses to help her abort it. He's like, no, you're gonna do this, you're gonna listen to me. Um, and like Van Helsing, David is a bombastic wind bag. He sucks. Just David. Um, another thing that I found interesting is that what is born from women can be argued as being inherently good in Prometheus. Although it may appear monstrous, the nonsense and a parasitic trilobite saves the day, as opposed to the inherently destructive creations of David, and even when humanity is executed, the engineers. So it takes something birthed from a woman, literally ripped from her belly in the most violent scene ever, to, uh, with bonus, impregnate the evil engineer and save all of us, because that engineer bounced like... We all would be dead, hypothetically, because they wanted to kill humanity. So way to go, tentacle Jesus. Um, <laughs> so moving on to the covenant. Um, the covenant is a colonization vessel, and um, it basically is like a giant womb, and it ties back again to male dominance, like male legislators trying to stop women from gaining their bodily auto autonomy um, in the first scene, because you have David um, looking through embryos. Apparently, after the merger, when Yutani knew it could make some serious fucking bank in in vitro fertilization and things like that. Um, but he's the one that is separating the embryos that appear to not be developing in certain ways and removing them. Again, father knows best. Waiting for mother, David basically leads him to this, and in the commentary, um, Scott is like, oh, he uses waiting for mother in this scene to calm um, this character down, whose name I can't forget, because I, I forgot because of cancer, I think it's Gorham. Um, and uh, yep, then Gorham sticks his face in the egg for science, and he knows what happens, but... What Scott says is that this character doesn't know he's about to become the mother. Um, and I say that Alien Covenant can't be viewed as a feminist text or a subversion of patriarchy because even though there are male birds in it, women are treated like shit in it. Like every one of these women is treated horribly. You have the pilot, Ferris, um, who has essentially been trained in acting appropriately in high stress situations. She looks cool, or than her loser husband in Tennessee, but she dies because she loses her cool. She can't shoot the um, little neomorph running around and blows up her shit by accident. Um, 
as opposed to the pilot in Aliens that kept that was also a woman and kept it together and tried to kill it. Um, and even though Tennessee doesn't look as cool, he effectively kills aliens. There's that whole shower scene debacle that belongs in other um, horror films because I feel like it doesn't belong in Alien because or in an Alien series film because Alien prides itself on having lofty ideals. Um, Dr. Shaw is just shat on and is perverse because David uses her DNA to do what she can't do in life. And I found a lot of, um, there's objection, my favorite definition of objection, through Gremlins too. Julia Kristeva views horror as a form of perverse objection or break down the boundary between the self and the other. The themes explored in the films such as Annihilation Society or at the climax of Gremlins 2 when the Gremlins melt and fuse into a pile of green slime. I use it in every class I teach on this. So basically what I really wanted to get to is my friend made the hammer key. These are the two effects he basically worked on directly. And he said that he thought the film was all about creation, so everything was like really penisy looking or vagina looking, but they had to have him like tone back the dickage and the vagina edge going on in that, because they said it was too graphic, and he was like, I thought it looked great, but I can answer more questions about that in question time. Um, so the last thing is I can connect anything to Finland with my superpower. So, um, Amanda Ripley, Ellen Ripley, and the Kalabala, and the power of a mother's love. So um, basically in Aliens, there, there's a really unique choice by the directors um, by opting to have Amanda not blame her mother or be alive and just scream her mother for being gone, um, like they intended in the original scripts, because that would have aligned with traditional thoughts on blaming mothers and mother blame. But the connection between Amanda, Ellen, and the Kalabala is that the Kalabala is a Finnish folklore tale that features a woman who's just known as Lemantinen's mother. She doesn't have a name of her own, her own just like Beowulf's mother. Or the Grenfell's mother, rather, in Beowulf. She's defined solely by being the mother of the son. And this son does something stupid and fucking dies and gets his body ripped apart everywhere and thrown all over the place. And she looks for him. She looks for him everywhere. She goes to heaven. He's not in heaven. She goes all over the earth. He's not in earth. Uh, where is he? He's in the underworld. She travels to the underworld, trolls the river of the dead. I drink out my mouth, it's so dry. Oh. And the guy's mother goes to the underworld, trolls the river of the dead, and sews her son back together. But her job isn't done. She needs the help of a magic bee to get him back to life. So to me, this is very reminiscent of Dr. Shaw basically picking up David's parts and sewing David back together. And bees are associated with feminine power, feminine energy. They live in hives. They have queens. What does that remind us of? The divorce. So there's a connection I tried to make between those two and the call of all. And it's a very traditional story of a mother's love being the only thing that can triumph over death. Um, and that also connects in alien isolation, because when you're grinding, you're trying to get all those recordings of your mom. Like, it's not really a subversion. It's more of an inversion. But in isolation, the only thing that keeps Amanda going, and she survived, she survived so much, the collapse of civil society. Um, random robots trying to kill her, literally everyone trying to kill her, a space station falling apart. The only thing that keeps her drive, her drive and, go, and going is this love she has for her mother. So I thought it was a very interesting inversion to a very traditional folk story. Um, it just shows that mom's love is magic. So in conclusion, this, this paper has argued that at first glance, Prometheus, Alien Covenant, and Alien Isolation occur in a futuristic world, but upon closer inspection, older contemporary issues surrounding patriarchy and motherhood remain. Um, furthermore, Prometheus, Alien Covenant, and Alien Isolation have the additional unifying theme of the horror and perversion of male creation, caused by mad scientists who are also bad dads, and women are expected to remain as mothers in the alien universe as long as they don't interfere with the acquisition of capital for the company. So, thank you. I'd just like to say, for start, so yes, this is a uh, sort of new project for me. There's a slight shift in the title. The original title came from a question that my husband asked me, asked me when we were watching Aliens, you know, in the run-up to this, and he was like, well, would you go back for Newt? Would you risk your life to go back and save Newt? Um, and I was originally going to talk about maternal um, obligation and the difference um, in sort of how your life changes when you have a baby and all of a sudden you kind of have this ethical relationship with an other, another who may have had certain sort of quite negative impacts on your life. Um, and instead, this actually as I started writing, it kind of shifted a little bit and what I'm going to be talking about today um, is specifically about postnatal depression and birth trauma and how we can sort of use films such as Alien to start to talk through these things. 
Um, so that's why the title might not actually quite make sense to what I'm going to be talking about during me. So basically, this is the start of a brand new project for me, coming out of my thesis that looked at the mother-child relationship from the perspective of the child, thinking about you know, maternal love and the desire to return to the maternal womb, but something very positive rather than sort of creeds, um, devouring sort of death drive. Um, and you know, what happened to me is I started taking stock of my life, thinking about what had changed since I'd done my PhD. The main thing that has changed is I had a baby. Okay, and for someone who spent the last four or five years writing on the importance of that mother-child bond, especially in the symbiotic union the first six months or so, I found that actually my experience of motherhood was very different to how I imagined, and that bond was not something that came easily for me. So I started thinking about you know, what the changes that have happened in my life since doing the PhD and how this might influence my research, and I think, well, what has changed? Yeah, I've had a son. I don't really have a social life anymore. The Thomas the Tank Engine theme tune runs through my head continuously, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, and what did strike me is that I found, so someone who sort of researches, writes on horror and extreme cinema for anything, that's what I love and what I enjoy, I'm still fine with gore, that's cool. But show me a child in mild peril, and it is literally like my heart has been ripped out of my body. I cannot handle it. I cannot handle parents and children being separated, or children dying, or things like that just really make me have this huge physical reaction and I want to turn it off. And I started speaking about this to other parents, you know, men and women, who said that actually they, they found a similar thing, that it changed the way they reacted to certain images um, in film and television. And so this is sort of getting me thinking about um, motherhood and spectatorship, because, you know, coming from motherhood studies, but also uh, I teach a lot of film theory, and I happen to be teaching a course about spectatorship at the time. So this paper, and along with the one I wrote on pre-bench, is the very start of that project, of thinking about the changes that go on in the maternal psyche um, when we become a mother, and um, thinking about it in a number of different ways. So firstly, thinking about how we can critique and rewrite spectatorship theory by inserting the mother back into the critical picture. Or in other words, how motherhood can shed light on how we watch a film. I want to think about how film can allow for a greater understanding to the changes in the maternal psyche when a woman becomes a mother. Um, and also, how film can provide us with examples um, to sort of discuss and talk through these changes. And that is what I'm going to be thinking about today in relation to Alien. So in her book um, of Woman Born, Adrienne Rich argues that it is impossible for a mother to write a book on motherhood without it being autobiographical. I want to caveat this slightly by saying that I love Rich's work on motherhood. I find her connections to trans misogyny deeply troubling. And I think we always have to point such connections out you know, when we are dealing um, with such theorists. But I've kind of spoken about that in other places, don't really have the time to do it now. But in terms of her writing on motherhood, I found a woman born a very sort of, uh, a very kind of important text when I was starting to work through my own feelings about motherhood. Now, as a couple of them, people have mentioned today, and Amanda just brought it up as well in women's studies, in generally in academia, we're told not to talk about our own personal feelings, to not to be subjective. You know, we believe, we propose, we do all those sorts of things, but, you know, generally we don't like to draw our emotion. Um, and subject to thought and experience. Obviously, women's studies and motherhood studies in particular are a place where actually, yet yeah, we can do that. And scholars such as Rich say, within motherhood studies in particular, if you're a mother writing on motherhood, you need to talk about your own experience. You need to embrace your own experience. The reason this is important for her is that she argues that self-reflexive thought and writing by mothers on motherhood is the only way that we can shed the patriarchal construction of and control over motherhood and start again. So Rich argues that by embracing our own maternal status and experience, we can, quote, quote, create a collective description of a world which will truly be ours. So what is this construction of motherhood and how does it relate to the alien franchise? To put it very bluntly, the constructed myth of motherhood is how society tells us we should feel when becoming a mother, in contrast to how many women, how women actually feel during pregnancy and postpartum. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about all women, but how some women 
women do feel when they become a mother for the first time. As Di Wen Stanley notes, the myth of motherhood operates through many different assertions. That, mother will feel, that mothers will feel an instant love for their child, that they will be content with their new life, and that they will feel complete, um, complete now they have welcomed another into their home and often their relationship. But actually, for many women, motherhood is also a time of loss, the loss of one's old life, independence, and even friendships. This is why researchers such as Paula Nicholson and Stephanie Zayas compare postnatal depression with mourning. So Paula Nicholson, for example, argues that postnatal depression is actually a healthy response to the losses felt when motherhood is entered into. She writes that, quote, daily life can be devastating. It might feel for the mother that she has lost everything she once had and expected for the future, but there is no going back. You cannot return the baby. But, you know, in all seriousness, Nicholson points out that postnatal depression can be something that maybe is normal, understandable, and even healthy, a way of the mind working through its new position. Now, if we're thinking about postnatal depression as being a sort of spectrum, we might have psychosis on one side and postnatal anxiety on the other, or what we kind of might call sort of negative mood symptoms on the other side. Now, she is obviously not referring to the sort of more severe side of postnatal depression, but actually the sort of significant portion of women that suffer some form of, of mild to middling um, depression and anxiety after giving birth. Now, there have been different statistics for this, but the NHS recently updated their own statistics, um, bringing in a study by the charity Four Children, which found that three in ten mothers suffer from postnatal depression, which is an increase from the um, figure of usually 10 to 15 percent that is given. The reason why Four Children found this increase is that they discovered that actually the vast well, the majority of women do not go to see their doctor when they are suffering from postnatal depression. That there is still this stigma or this unwillingness to seek out medical help. Up to 58% of the women that they found with postnatal depression did not seek out medical help. Further to this, Nicholson is also referring to up to the 80% of women who report suffering from the quote baby blues, a term I hate, um, in the first six weeks postpartum, and also the 80% of women who experience, or up to 80% of women who experience different levels of anxiety, prenatal and postnatal. I say up to 80% because the figures do vary significantly um, in the many different studies that have been done on this. So being one of these women myself, when I came across this comparison between postnatal depression and loss, um, the idea that it is actually quite a reasonable, understandable reaction to the changes in my life, I found incredibly liberating. But the society does not suggest that it is so. Women are expected to love their babies. There is the expectation that the minute we first look at our newborn child, we will be filled with an overwhelming love, a love that we instantly want to post about on Facebook and Instagram. Society expects that we will willingly give up our previous life, our freedom, our independence in the service of another. I tried to be reasonably open with how I found motherhood. When people asked me, I would say, well, to be honest, I'm a bit bored, because no one ever tells you how boring looking after a newborn baby is. It's monotonously boring at times. So I said I'm bored, but I was really surprised, and what really struck me was the amount of times after sort of, you know, edging around the fact that I was not feeling too happy, about my status as a new mother, I would be told, and you know, told by people, you are loving it though, aren't you? You are loving it though, aren't you? And I'm like, I just said to you that I'm not. Why, why can you not accept this? It's like I wasn't even allowed to voice my own discontent. Now I want to contrast this with another conversation I had. Remember my baby, my baby was about four months old and I had to go and deliver a parcel to the woman who lived opposite me, who I hadn't actually seen since I had my son. I didn't really know her. And I knocked on her door and she was like, oh, how are you doing? And she said to me, she was like, how are you doing? Those first few months are dark, aren't they? And I was like, yes, they are. But why does nobody tell you this? Those first few months are really dark. I mean, some people obviously have lovely times and they do want for their children straight away. But not everyone. And I was a bit like, that kind of really stuck with me. Those first few months are dark. And I was like, yeah, yeah, they're really dark. And I kind of, you know, I felt like we kind of need to talk to each other about this, preferably even before children are born, so we can be a bit more prepared. Because it's about saying, okay, yeah, you know, knowing what's going to come in a way, or being able to sort of share 
this sort of these feelings, and you know, this is what I kind of am working through in this project. So Dyer and Stanley argue, so this cultural myth of motherhood renders such thoughts of discontent unspeakable. When women are surrounded with images of happy mothers staring lovingly at their children, they feel as though any thoughts counter to total love and contentment must be kept secret. When Stanley suggests that this mothering myth is ultimately one of social coercion, the patriarchal society actively promotes the happy mother as a model of successful womanhood. She writes, if the image can become powerful enough, it can condition and socialize women into striving to fulfill their ordained roles in society. To fall from grace, to deny this model, is to be an outsider, unnatural and despised. So strong is this image that the template can be internalized into the psyche of women to be passed from generation to generation. So this myth that seeks to perpetuate the figure of the perfect mother is also that which feeds prepartum and postpartum anxiety and depression. Parents, especially mothers, must hide feelings of discontent for fear of being labelled abnormal, even monstrous. But if they were able to talk about such thoughts, to realise they were not alone in their sense of loss and anxiety, then maybe they would not be felt so keenly. I'm interested in how cinema can act as a tool to encourage women to speak honestly about their experiences of pregnancy and motherhood, and this is where this is one stage of this project is coming from. So in other words, I'm interested in how films such as the Alien franchise can allow women to start a personal or shared dialogue about their experiences and find potentially empowering points of identification in their narratives. This will, at times, embrace reading sort of against the like, ideological brain and adopting a specifically maternal position. By this I mean that, you know, we can understand that as a franchise, mm, okay, I'm just as a franchise, um, the alien films uh, do have this very regressive, sort of negative view of, of the maternal reproductive abilities, but that maybe we can also try and sort of reassess this from a maternal position and reclaim it that maybe we can reclaim our own productive abilities. So discussions of Ripley always seem to have men and patriarchy as one part of the equation. Ripley as the ideal mother figure for a male audience. Ripley's maternal side easing the patriarchal fears that she might be too masculine, etc., etc. But what about women, specifically mothers, identifying with Ripley woman to woman? Ripley is always positioned as the female mother to the male audience, to male society. But what if we consider her as a point of identification, mother to mother? Would this then allow for a different, potentially valuable reading or understanding of the film? We have all these discussions about Alien and indeed many other horror films and the maternal, but we never consider what it is like for real mothers who are watching them. I'm bored of talking about the male fear of the reproductive system. <laughs> it's women who have to give birth. What about our fears? What about our feelings? And that's where I want to talk about. <laughs> so, as you're all aware, in just about every text on the franchise, it mentions this sort of motherhood at some point. I'm going to skip through these really quickly because I'm running out of time. And we have heard so much about Creed, obviously. But basically, you kind of understand what Creed's argument was. I'm not going to go through it again now. The other person I wanted to refer to was Caldwell. Thomas Caldwell follows this sort of same view of Creed um, when he argues that aliens present quote, two extremes of femininity with masculinity caught in the crossfire. So obviously Creed is talking, starts to introduce this idea of the binary between the <coughs> sort of uh, the monstrous feminine, the monstrous abject biological mother and the sort of mythical mothering. And Caldwell agrees with this. And he extends this dichotomy to a, to a distinction between nature and industry, with the alien mother on the side of nature and the crew and patriarchy and on the side of industry. This is a mining ship, after all, controlled by mother the computer. Ripley, in Caldwell's view, is still aligned with nature, but she's the good, clean mother, the sterile version of motherhood that saves rather than devours, penetrates, or gives birth. As such, he concludes that the film is a complex text that reflects cultural anxieties about femininity while simultaneously promoting progressive attitudes towards femininity. To quote his final line, after all, the mother is the one who ends up defeating the bitch. Likewise, Linda Bunsen argues the alien, um, the alien other, embodies the female reproductive powers, but she does not see it as a progressive text. 
She writes that the major confrontation of the second film is not, not that of the Marines versus the alien, but between Rip, quote, Ripley, a woman who practices the maternal as compassionate care, versus the biological maternal principle of monstrous proportions embodied in the alien other, end quote. Barnson argues that she will never be able to embrace the film as a feminist text, as the female body is represented as a source of complete primal terror. So there, I'm just going to really briefly introduce three examples of this sort of discussions that have come out of alien and motherhood, um, and this desire to create these sort of binaries, these, this binary relationship in motherhood that comes out through the alien films. So this is good, the good mother versus the bad mother, nature versus industry, the archaic mother versus the mother hero, the biological mother versus social mothering. Basically a split between the abject mother who gives birth and the mythical mother of patriarchy, who carries out the act of mothering cleansed of all the icky bits of the female reproductive system. Now as Charles Hicks has pointed out, these binaries are an overtly simplistic way of thinking with the many different aspects of motherhood that the alien franchise presents, and indeed that litter our society. And as a third wave feminist, I know that it is these binaries that we need to de deconstruct to challenge patriarchy. This key split that the scholars over the years have isolated in the alien franchise between the abject biological mother, the alien, and the mythical maternal figure of Ripley is that very myth that patriarchal society subjects women to in order to subjugate them. We are meant to be the mythical mother. We are not meant to be the biological abject mother. She needs to be pushed away and sort of ignored. Because, as Chris Daver has argued, along with others, patriarchal society needs to cover over the fact that it came from the maternal womb. It needs to repress that and therefore bring up this wonderful sort of mythical mother, this focus on maternal love, self-sacrifice and finding fulfillment in the care of another. But unless you outsource the production and care of your child, motherhood generally is quite icky. It does involve a lot of snot and blood and, and goop and things like that. And this is why I think it is not as simple as to say that with the first two alien films, we can find it empowering to identify with Ripley, mother to mother that actually this doesn't quite work because Ripley is the mythic mother. We know she's given birth, we find that out in the you know, extended cut of the Aliens film, but we don't see that birth in these first two films. Instead we kind of imagine it maybe to be a bit more like sort of people coming out of the sleep pods, that it's all going to be fine and sterile and lovely. What we get instead um, is this particular scene. So, sorry I'm nearly finished for it. Um, at the beginning of Aliens, we are presented with this scene where Ripley wakes up in a hospital bed. Now for many women, childbirth is one of the few times where they spend sort of uh, an overnight stay in hospital, or you know, hopefully within their lives, and as such, medical settings can link women back to personal birth experiences, both positive and negative. Although I doubt if we all looked as sort of beautifully made up as Ripley does in these particular sequences. <laughs> Now the link between Ripley and motherhood is strengthened by the return of Jonesy, brought in by birth. Jonesy obviously with the help of those skimpy pants is what sort of links or kind of um, uh, calm sort of um, uh, masculine or patriarchal sort of fears in the first one makes her sort of balances out her masculine characteristics in the first film. Burke informs Ripley that she's been asleep for 57 years. When we see a close-up of her face, a look of shock and possibly loss a connection that we can retroactively make if we watch the extended cut of the film and find out about her daughter. This link between 57 years and the loss of a childhood, as obviously she doesn't know her child is dead yet, is reinforced through a cut back to Jonesy. Um, at the same time, however, during this shot, Jonesy morphs from being sort of this cute, cuddly kitty to sort of, um, you know, this more sort of xenomorphic like kissing that he goes through. And this signals a transition within the sequence. Suddenly, Ripley looks gripped with pain. She begins to throw herself about on the bed. Um, and for those of you that have seen the first film, obviously we're instantly going to think chest burster, aren't you? But also for some women who have experienced a more traumatic birth, we could arguably say that this is again bringing back feelings or memories from such a traumatic birth. 
we then see as the shot goes on a continual image of obviously the um, chest burst to sort of let the, the, the xenomorph kind of try to come out of alien's stomach, but it's okay. It was all just a dream. Nobody panic, it's fine. Ripley doesn't really give birth. Instead, she hugs Jonesy close in an act of mothering, soothes him, and tells him everything will be all right. So therefore, I believe that this scene marks Ripley as the mythical mother, rather than having a real connection to biological motherhood. Even though she herself is a mother, um, she, this, we don't really see this. She's kind of all on this mythical side. It's all a dream. This is just her upside down in a way. This is just a negative thing. It's okay. This is not her. We're reassured that she is this mythical mother. Everything is okay. So therefore, we can continue to imagine that the birth of her daughter, and by that the extension of the birth of us, the patriarchal audience, would be more like this. And less like this. <laughs> <laughs> However, for many women, no, you like this, you're not, you know, you are loving it though, aren't you? For many women though, actually, my birth was probably a bit more like this. Oh, that's how it felt to me as someone who went through a form of, of sort of birth trauma. I don't look back and think that, I kind of look back and think that. And this is why, am I running really over time, Griff? Sorry. No. I'm on my own. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'm just on my last bit. I'm just literally last page. So, birth trauma is something I wanted to talk about. And this is because actually between 33 and 45% of women perceive their birth to be traumatic. And this idea of perceiving is very important. So this means although these women may not have experienced actual threat to their lives, they perceive that threat to be the case. Okay, and um, Cheryl uh, Tatana Beck is a, a sort of recent theorist of birth trauma. She says that actually, you know, birth trauma lies in the eyes of the beholder. What labor and delivery staff would consider a routine successful birth may be perceived as traumatic by the mother. So such an experience can result in a greater prevalence of postnatal depression or anxiety and or can result in post-traumatic stress disorder. So even though on the surface, a birth may appear to be more like that. In terms of the woman, she may feel that it is more like this. But this is the crux of the issue, because women are encouraged to repress such feelings. They are told that they're happy now, that it was all worth it, that it's natural and normal for women to give birth. I mean, women do it all the time. It's going to be fine. But this leads to feelings of failure, depression, anger, and an inability, inability to connect with one's child. So basically what I want to say is we can be more willing to accept that birth may feel like this rather than telling women it feels like this all the time. This is how maybe we can start to shift this sort of split between biological motherhood and the mythical maternal. We need to stop identifying with Ripley. We need to start identifying with the alien baby or with other forms of sort of abjection that come across in the alien films. And more importantly, what we need to do is to be open about it, to talk about it, to share our stories with other women. So what I wanted to close on, and just to draw on um, what Frances may have said in her paper the other day, yes, those first few months can be dark, but uh, let's get a flame power and guide each other through it like Ripley does in this time. Sorry for running over.